Please stand. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Let not your heart be troubled. He believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That way I am there ye may be also and whither I go ye know and the way ye know Thomas saith unto him Lord we know not what we should go and how can we know the way Jesus saith unto him I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. A blessed good morning to all. A blessed good morning to all. It is still a good morning. And on behalf of the entire family, we welcome all of you for this home going service for the departed Rosemary Ursula Henry. Thank you so kindly for coming. We shall commence with Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Dr. Kathy Ann Cave Henry, she will come and read at this time. Um, good morning, everyone. The lesson is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. I'm reading from the New International Virgin. 
There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, and a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. Here ends this morning Bible reading. Our first hymn, Through All the Changing Scenes of Life, followed by prayer by Sister Joan Bell. Through All the Changing Scenes of Life. remain standing for the prayer. Good morning to all. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I thank you, dear Lord, this morning that we can call upon your holy name. Father Lord, we draw strength from you. I pray, O oh God, for this service today. I ask, Heavenly Father, that there will be no distractions there will be no interference. I pray, oh God, for the equipment that should, should be used. I pray for the hands that would use the equipment. I pray, Heavenly Father, that this service would run to your honor and to your glory. Father, for those that would be having a heavy heart now, I pray, mighty God, that you would remove the heaviness, Lord, and clothe them with peace and rejoicing. Father, I thank you for those here and those far out. Whoever will have anything to do in this service, I ask your blessings upon them now. Father Lord, for his, her two children, 
Tyson and Hartley. I pray, mighty God, you would just comfort them. Just give them the peace that passeth all understanding unto them. Father, Lord, we are all family and we are all will have hurtings. But Father and God, we draw strength from you to overcome whatever should happen. I pray, mighty God, you will bless each individual here. Whatever is said and done will be done to the honor and glory of your name. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we have the tributes, again, we want to welcome all of you and to express our sincere appreciation having you join us and the family this morning. We want to take the opportunity as well to acknowledge some persons who are amongst us, we wish to acknowledge our Prime Minister, the Honorable Mayor Amor Motley. We wish to acknowledge the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt. We wish to acknowledge our Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Santia Bradshaw, His Excellency, Ambassador to China, Mr. Hallam Henry, Ministers of Government, Members of Parliament, Senators, Public Officers, Executive Chairman of QEH, General Secretary of the BWU, and other businessmen, civil society persons, friends, and relatives, we salute you this morning as we pay a final tribute to our beloved Rosemary Ursula Henry. In the end, we want to express on your behalf deepest condolences to all sorrowing relatives and friends and to assure them that underneath them are the everlasting arms and that God will sustain them during this period of pain and sorrow. A friend will now come and pay the first tribute. Eva will now come followed by Mr. Trevor Henry. A blessed good morning to all. I am indeed humbled to have been asked to do a tribute this morning on Rosemary's behalf. My name is Ava Griffith and I am a retired nurse midwife and nursing educator here in Barbados. The tapestry of our lives is woven as we encounter and interact with the individuals we meet along life's way. Each person is like a thread, intertwined with the other in unique ways as we add character, enhancing and leaving an indelible impact on others as we create interesting patterns. We weave knots of strength we add color and hues of hope and faith. We raise self-awareness and inspire each other to dream and aspire towards the pinnacles in our lives. We encourage each other to be the best that we can be as we journey. My life has certainly been enriched, having met and worked with Rosemary Henry in the early 1980s on Ward A3 of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Rose, as she was referred to by friends and colleagues, was a caring, compassionate nurse. I was a young wife, mother, and nurse. Rose was a more mature lady who had traveled and worked in England. She taught me how to budget, 
how to manage my tasks. And some and shared her life experiences with me. Always immaculately dressed, she loved to sew, and we exper experimented with styles and patterns. We shared our children with each other, especially Tyson and my son, my late son, Noel. The boys were a handful, and we enjoyed interacting with each other as we drew strength to mother these boys. What drew me to her most was her interaction with the patients. To her, each one was important and special. She was never too busy to answer their calls and listen to their concerns. Rose would find time to sit with them, hold a hand, listen to their problems, give advice, read from the Bible for them, and offer prayer when needed. One night, as she and I manned the night shift, a female patient who had been with us for, for many weeks became restless and noisy, which was out of character, for she was usually quiet, a devout Christian who would comfort other patients and keep service early in the morning with the others. We rushed to her bedside to realize that she had begun to transition towards her final journey. I summoned the doctor, who agreed that there was not much more physical assistance that would help. Her relatives were summoned, and her sister and daughter took a taxi and came to visit and comfort her, but could not stay for the entire night. Rose and I took turns over the next hours to sit with her, hold her hand, sing hymns softly, and we prayed with her. She was ready to go and acknowledged that she was happy and eager to be with her Lord. She transitioned peacefully and died with an angelic glow on her face just before dawn. Truth be told, Rose and I cried as we held her hand and each other's hand as she left us. How we got through the rest of the shift, I can't really say but we managed to present a strong front to the other patients and our relatives when they returned to view the body. Rose, neither of us slept that day, but we had to work again the night. That experience drew us closer as friends. Rose encouraged me to further my studies and would say that I was wasting my talent. You were born to teach, Ava. Look how well you handle the student nurses and medical students. Try and move up. Rose lived to see me become a nursing instructor, and I know that she encouraged many others to dream big and pursue further studies. Rose was resilient, regal, displayed an overabundance of caring. She was selfless, sweet-spirited, and an encourager in many creative ways. She touched many lives. Sleep on, my friend, and may you rest in the arms of Jesus until we meet again. Thank you. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in the time of trouble. I stand before you here today, not only for myself, but for my three brothers, Samuel, the Reverend Clyde Henry, the Reverend Dr. David Henry, our wives and children who unfortunately are unable to join us today. We gathered here this day as a family and friends to comfort one another 
and to be a support to the family of late Rosemary Henry, who unfortunately is no longer here with us. We mourn her loss, and words cannot adequately express the grief that fills our hearts today. We are aware that we will someday have to cross this bar, and when the time comes, we are nevertheless at a loss. Rose has been a dear cousin to me, a person whom I have called on and have rallied with for advice. We stand, we started off as children when I first went to see my grandfather who lived in Ellerton St. George, it was our grandfather I should say, in Ellerton St. George. And that friendship continued when Rose migrated to England in search of a better life. Guess what happened? I followed her to England and back to Barbados. And so you see what an extended period of friendship. She was trustworthy, kind, and dedicated, and will always go the extra mile. She was a visionary and would always talk to you about making plans to move towards the next step. I call Rose my sister. On a lighter note, Rose was a great cook and it was a pleasure to see her preparing flying fish for a meal with her secret recipe. And for those who had not had the opportunity to share with her fish, you are, and for those who had the opportunity to share her fish, you are blessed. You, I know what you mean. There is, however, a sense of hope in knowing that always, that along the way, Rose had made her election sure and gives us the hope that we will one day be gathered together at, as the people of God around the table, lifting up our voices in praise to the eternal king. Their death and sorrow will have no power or dominion over us. I close with these words. And I digress a bit. I spent probably four days trying to research some comforting words. And lo and behold, I spoke to my brother. He told me the same thing. As I walk into the church, the same message was given. I'm going to use the same message, but it's not for the sake of redundancy. It is for the sake of a deep belief. In John 14, 1 to 2, it says, let not your heart be troubled. We believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. There where I am, there ye may be also. Rose, we will miss you. But we hold on to the words of a song by Bobby Venton. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Sugar is sweet, but not as sweet as you. Rose, we miss you. It is okay to give an applause in this service. As I sat down and looked across the congregation, I saw representatives of China as anticipated, and I want to acknowledge especially the ambassador of China to Barbados and his representatives. Please put your hands together for them. I, I also, I mentioned the executive chairman of QEH. But I think I would be doing a serious disservice 
if I did not mention her husband, not only as a minister of government, but as the parliamentary representative of St. George South and my very good friend, the Honorable Dwight Sutherland. Please put your hands together for him. Very glad to have all of you with us. I also see the Honorable Cynthia Ford. Please, I know I lump all of you together, but I also acknowledge these persons. I also am pleased to be given the opportunity to direct this service. I am familiar and very familiar with the Henry family. I'm happy to see my good friend Hartley and a former Sunday school student who happens to be his wife. But she was my student first. And I believe I may have had a little hand. I see Minister Dwight is nodding his head. He was also one of my, and I, I see my daughter's good friend and his wife, Mr. Tyson. I'm very happy to ha see you as well together with your wife. I see Mr. Clayton Henry wants my best friend. <laughs> wants. I don't know what happened. He disappeared from the scene and together with Jefferson Lashley and David Gibson, we were all four of us together running through Ellerton and I see Mrs. Perlin Walker in the back. I'm happen, happy to see all the Ellertonites who are gathered here as a Good place, good place to be in all the siblings. I'm so happy to see you. We shall now be serenaded with a musical tribute by Romaro Graves and Mark Andrew Daniel. Please put your hands together as they come.
very well done. We shall now have a tribute by the Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Mia Mortley. Please put your hands together as she comes. Good morning all. Morning. The last tribute reflected the spirit of the lady and her demeanor even as she passes from us today. Cheerful, content, and inspiring. And I say so because, above all else, the one word that came to me as I reflected over the last 24 hours, particularly given, as Tyson would tell you, that five days before, I can't call her Rosemary, <laughs> Ms. Bryce passed. I spent about an hour with her at her home and was completely satisfied that I was dealing with someone who not only understood her condition, but who truly, truly was accepting of all that she faced because she knew what she had conquered, and she knew the race that she had run. And when I say so, it carries me back to the language of the Bible that says that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. The graciousness and the grace that enveloped that moment that I spent with her reinforced in me that to reflect on the life that she had lived and that what she had achieved was truly, truly remarkable. Ms. Henry was born in May, May 4th, 1944. I didn't need anybody to tell me what kind of person she was born that time. Because I have a grandfather, Ernest Motley, an uncle, Elombe Motley, and a sister, Elam Motley, all of whom born in those early days of May. But what struck me was that she was born in the very same year that women was given, were given the right to vote. And if you therefore understand that, you better understand what she has been able to achieve in her life and the circumstances against which she had to tread in order to make that passage, not just for herself, but for her three children. Sacrifice, commitment, hard work, faith, faith, faith and grace. And I can see in her children that strong commitment. I didn't know her daughter. But in Tyson and Hartley was reflected that strong commitment to hardcore values that built this country. Hers was the role of a matriarch. Hers was the role of a caregiver. Hers was the role of a nurturer. And it is therefore no surprise to anyone that she would have given herself and her life to taking care of others. I truly smiled this morning when I heard the tribute from her colleague and friend, Ms. Griffith, and how she would have responded to patients. And you know, 
Whenever I speak, I use three verbs to try to open up our minds and our hearts. I ask people to hear people. I ask people to see people. And I ask people to feel people. And it is therefore no surprise to me that all that I've heard from her children, from her friends, reflected that deep sense of empathy and caring that has forever been characterized by those associated with that noble profession of nursing. But it isn't only in the profession she chose, it is in how she nurtured her family and her children. And I want us today to salute her because as I said, growing up in Barbados in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, we could have gone either way, either way. Let's be real. But she chose to set out on a path that would allow her to give to others and would allow her also to ensure that those for whom she had responsibility, her children and her family, that they would reflect those very values. They say, as we know, that it takes a village to raise a child. And that is true. And I have no doubt, as I see with the strong bond with her sisters, that that clearly was part and parcel of her credo. But equally, it is necessary for one person to propel two. And when I listen to the stories from Hartley, there is no doubt in my mind that she provided the propulsion for them as young men. And Ms. Griffith, I heard you when you said, boys are difficult to manage. <laughs> and that, in and of itself, shows you the steadfastness of her character and her commitment to ensure that those who passed and saw her boys would know that they fell from her because they say pear don't fall from an apple tree and that therefore they had to behave and believe in a certain way. I better understand why Hartley's is, is, is so driven by also being dressed properly and being comported and deported properly. Once I got to know her, pear didn't fall from an apple tree with him there either nor with Tyson, who himself is a dresser. <laughs> we live in this world only to make it better and easier for those around us. And if that is a measurement that we judge ourselves by, then we can say today that even to the very end, Rosemary Henry was not just the matriarch. She was the nurturer, the provider. And above all else, she understood that even as she ailed, hers was a duty to ensure that those around her would not fall apart in the midst of all that was going on. Her calmness and her serenity and her grace assured the family of that. I want to also single out Kathy Ann Cave Henry because I happen to know the extent to which Kathy Ann, you also provided the rock and was the daughter that she regrettably had had to bury. It cannot be easy for a parent to bury their child. And that she continued with such grace and such steadfast support for Tyson and for Hartley, in spite of the loss of her daughter, is equally another tribute to her. But I know that in you, from all that has been said and from my own interactions, that you were that rock for her. So that let us today celebrate and give thanks for a life well lived and for a life that made a difference 
You know, people feel that Hartley is the political strategist, but I'm here to tell you that equally pear didn't fall from an apple tree there, and that it was she who also had that keen sense of awareness of what people felt and the mood. And as we would reflect, even though when people would say something on a call-in program, and you know how people set up to talk and talk and talk and call and call and call, she had the discernment to know, go beyond that. And three hours in Bridgetown would allow you to know what truly was the mood. And for those who had the wisdom to listen to her, then you would understand when I say that she truly was a political strategist from which he learned his craft. Isaiah 40 tells us at verse 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Rosemary Henry waited upon the Lord with grace. Her faith has been renewed. She is mounting now with wings as eagles do. And as she runs from this earth, we know that she shall not be weary and that she shall be held in the hands of the Almighty, forever comforted, because throughout life, grace and faith defined her. May her soul rest in peace and may she rise in glory. Thank you. The next voice that you will hear to read the lesson, John 14, 1 to 6, is the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, the Honorable Fuswell Skerritt. And I just wish to say that when he began duties as Prime Minister, he was a young man. And it amazes me that I think he's still the probably the longest serving prime minister currently in the Caribbean. And for some reason, he still remains young. And I don't see any gray hair, so I wish after the service to speak to him so that he can advise me his secret. Please welcome the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt. Thank you very much. I want, uh, if the most reverend has allowed me to say a few words uh, before I do the reading. And, and so I want again to publicly express my deepest condolences to, to Hartley and Tyson and the entire Henry family. I have known uh, Auntie, as I call her, um, for the last 19 years. Hartley having been the political strategist for our party, the Dominican Labour Party since 1990. And I agree, Prime Minister Motley, that Hartley really got his tutelage from his mother. So don't let him fool you, <laughs> you know. Um, but we have lost a very wonderful lady uh, who devoted herself to this country. And I can only imagine the kind of conversations she's going to have with Owen Arthur and David Thompson. <laughs> uh, we, we can all imagine uh, the, the discussions when she gets to, to heaven and she, she meets with them. So may, may your soul rest in eternal peace. And on behalf of my country, because she was in fact, I must still tell you, my strongest supporter. So I've lost the strongest supporter I've had um, for, for the last 19 years as Prime Minister of our country. Um, I am not the longest serving, while Gonzalez is, uh, but, but I believe very soon I may take over. <laughs> Thank you very much. I read from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Yea, believe in God. 
believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may also, may be also. And whither I go, ye know. And the way, ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. My dear brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's all stand together for the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou If we believe that God is indeed great and so is his faithfulness, 
I just want us to sing lustily the second verse, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, and then we shall do the chorus and hope. I want to hear all the parts, the bass, the altos, the tenors, and of course, the sopranos. Rosemary may not be able to hear us, but we are paying her tribute. And I would want us to sing lustily to give God thanks for her life. And just watch me in the chorus. Some of you can't see me, so I may have to mount the top so you can see my hand as we sing together summer and winter. That's the Ellerton yes. worship. Yes. Now the siblings will come and pay tribute. Myrtle, Reverend Beryl, Mellis, and Joan, please welcome them as they come.
Please put your hands again for the siblings, letting them know we appreciate. And this time we shall have the eulogy by His Excellency Ambassador Hallam Henry. Morning. I was fine until that song, I must be honest. Early, early last Wednesday morning, my grandmother, Rosemary Ursula Henry, surrendered in her battle with cancer and slipped peacefully away. Some may say she lost this fight. But my family and I don't see it that way, because we truly believe. Having fought a difficult life, but with sound achievement, raised a family with love, worked at a career with passion, and served her country and fellow citizens with commitment as the nurse, she has now gone on to be with her maker. We know that this loss comes to all families, and painful though it is, just as granted, we accept that our turn has come. There's no doubt in our minds that the creator who gave her life will come back one of his own with the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Like her, we will therefore try to bear this time of trial with grace, quiet dignity, and abiding faith in God. There's so much to be said about my grandmother. <laughs> and so little time today to share with you a life well lived and a woman well lived. In that regard, my sister Valencia and I join with our entire family in expressing our deep appreciation for the kind and numerous messages of condolence which we have received. On the call today, we have support from China, where I'm currently am, and from Italy. Grazie mille alla famiglia italiana. If you can see, we'll talk about the point of the tone of Mums, as I always called her, was born 78 years ago in Gunnitain, in the rural Paris of St. George. Her mother, Gwyneth Henry, was a homemaker. Her father, Richard Henry, held what was then considered the prestigious job of engineer at Buckley Sugar Factory. These were the days when Barbados was a monocrop agricultural economy and sugar was king. Buckley played a pivotal role in rural life and in the country's sugar production. Apart from mumps, there were five other children in the Henry's household. Verna, who was called Myrtle, who is called Myrtle, Beryl, Hallam, the lone boy, Mums in the middle, and after her, Melis and John. Although she was younger, and John would become almost like Mums twin, and shared the special bond with her, right up until the very Up until the end. Those early days were hard ones in Barbados. Reflecting on my grandmother's life, I came to realize how much it was a mirror of the social and economic development of Barbados. First, her rural upbringing, dominated by plantation life. Then, the extended family structure, with her grandparents also living in St. George. This would prove fortuitous. For like his father before him, my grandfather's father was a military man and as one of the Empire's colonists, became a soldier for the United Kingdom in the Second World War. He returned to Barbados from the war, a different man. The household became tense and unhappy, which led to the divorce of Mum's parents. Following that, the siblings were split up and went to live with different aunts and grandparents. 
It also led to their relocation from St. George to three different communities in urban St. Michael. The siblings eventually returned to St. George to reside at Farm Road with their mother sometime after Hurricane Janet in 1955. By the 1960s, like many women then and now, Mons was a struggling single parent to her daughter, Rosalind, born in 1962, and my father, Hartley, born in 1964. She took various jobs in an effort to make ends meet, including working, at a maid, working as a maid at residence in workplace. But a life that, all, that was already hard became harder. And in 1969, Mums migrated to the United Kingdom, joining numerous other Barbadian and Caribbean nationals searching for opportunity. Although she did not then know it, with this move, Mums was also becoming part of the history of what is now known as the Windrush Generation. Those people who migrated to England from its colonies in the West Indies between 1948 and 1971 to help fill the UK's post-war labor shortages Grand developed three traits that would remain with her throughout her life. These were an unyielding commitment to her children's well-being, caring for her fellow human beings, and a fierce determination to succeed at whatever she put her mind to. Initially, Mums worked as a servery maid at the police training college in Bramshill, Hampshire, but her sister Beryl was already an established nurse in England and, and encouraged her to follow suit. So in 1970, Mums went into training at the Whittington Hospital, North London, St. Mary's Royal, where she successfully completed studies as a state enrolled nurse. She then returned to Barbados in November 1972 and resumed parenting of my father and aunt, who were left in the care of her eldest sister, Myrtle, living then in Salters Tenetry Road, St. Michael. On April 3, 1973, my grandmother entered the service of the still relatively new national tertiary healthcare institution, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, as a nurse. This was significant in many ways. It would demonstrate her capacity for lifelong professional and personal loyalty. Mums became a part of that corps of early nurses trained in the UK, who helped to build the QEH and its reputation. She would serve there for 30 years through the hospital's growths and changes until her retirement in 2004 at age 60. In her career as a nurse, Mums found her passion, combining her training with the love for people and a deep capacity for selfless service. Even when Mums was on her last days, she was Nurse Henry, focusing on what was best for the country and advocating for excellence in health and patient care. As a matter of fact, as the PM just said, on the Friday of the week before, Prime Minister Motley called and had them visited my grandmother. Mums held the PM in conversation about the QEH and what was needed to improve its operations, management, and nursing care. On the day that Grand started her career as a nurse in Barbados, she met another new entrant, Jewel Hunt, who was assigned to the recovery room while Mums was assigned to the operating theater. At their respective posts, the two would have had to work closely together and they formed a strong professional bond and a lifelong relationship. Joel remarked on elements of Grant's personality, which were special to all of us. She said that Grant was no pushover. She was not a yes woman. When the situation warranted, she would speak up respectfully, but firmly in the face of nonsense, even from higher authorities. She was very trustworthy, such a great friend and confidant. People were moved to seek her counsel, which she always gave willingly. She was a principled person and set high standards for herself and her children. Her many good qualities caused much admiration from Jewel and those who knew her. Graham was also an avid gardener and loved spending time with her plants. She grew fruit, such as sugar apples and Jamaican ivy, and gave them to others. She enjoyed and valued spirited conversation and laughed heartily at a good joke. She was a great cook and loved to entertain, offering wonderful meals and red carpet treatment to all who entered her doors, especially those coming from overseas. 
She often made wreaths from funerals of people who had passed on. These were not for money, not at all. Always sensitive to the needs of others, having a sense of propriety, and as she put it, not wanting to overstep her bones. She would first ask the family of the person who had passed if they would mind if she sent a wreath. Once they said yes, she would go to town, purchase the necessary flowers, and make the wreath. Grant and Joe were both members of the Feel Special About Yourself group. The name of the group says it all. Its purpose was to make others feel special about themselves, and the group's members used to use their own resources and contacts to make hampers or purchase essentials and gifts for the residents of children's homes, district hospitals, and other institutions. The thread of caregiving was woven deep into my grandmother's personality, and she fully understood how demanding it was. That explains why her final instructions were not about herself, but about ensuring that those who had cared for her were appropriately recognized for their service. Granny was a people's person. She cared for her patients with singular focus, often staying long after her shift had ended to support colleagues in the care of patients who needed her or were in crisis. My father and his stepdad, her then partner Leroy, would often have to wait in the car for periods up to an hour after her shift before she appeared for her ride home. They learned to recognize and grew accustomed to the tension in her body, the concern on her face and manner, as well as the calls throughout the night to and calls through the night to and from the hospital. Whenever she had a patient whom she felt would not make it. As a parent, she was strict and vigilant, but loving mother. There were few streetlights back then, and the bus service at that time made it particularly difficult for a child from our part of the island to get to school. My dad, partly, who was younger than his sister Rosalind, would often be sent to the bus stop with her at 5.30 in the morning, where she would take the bus from Ellison to Spitestone, St. Peter, and then on to St. Andrew, to the Alleyne School, which she had passed for in the common entrance exam. Dad did not admit to mums that the walk to the bus stop in the unelectrified darkness of the early country mornings frightened me. Implicitly understanding this was a lesson in manhood. Mum secured an appointment to see then Minister of Education about a transfer for Rosalind to another school. Unfortunately, he was not empathetic to her arguments about Rosalind's safety and the amount of time lost every day in the long commute from St. George to St. Andrew. The minister, told, the minister told my grandmother that if a child was to learn, they would learn anywhere. A heated argument ensued, but the minister held his ground. Mum res resolved that the situation would not get the better of her. She ensured Auntie Ross took her books until she was able to perform well enough in O levels to move to Common Mere for A levels, and following that to Cape Hill campus for her degree and a career in the teaching service. Under the supervision of Mums, Auntie Ross was the anchor of both my dad and Uncle Tyson's communication careers. She was the linguist of the family and studiously guided her siblings in the use of that most in the use of that most difficult of languages, English. Auntie Ross was a close friend of late Prime Minister David Thompson, and it was she who forged what later became a historic friendship and link between Thompson and my dad. It is possible that some natural intuition or maternal instinct told mums that her girl child Rosalind would need special protection. But many years later, when the young girl at the bus stop had turned 46 and was herself a mother of three, the Quayle, the Kembe, and, and Ebony, and a secondary school teacher, she was diagnosed with the same stomach cancer which would later come and take mums. As a nurse and caregiver, my grandmother was powerless to save her child. Despite enduring a parent's worst nightmare and pain, that of having a child predecessed them, moms went every day to her home to take care of her, right up until the day that Rosalind passed from the split. Grant approached this gut-wrenching experience with her characteristic outward grace and dignity. Angie Ross had Grant's love and protection but my father had many important life lessons and her love. 
one of the early lessons was how to overcome disappointment and use it as a stepping stone. When he made it to St. George Secondary School, and not to one of the oldest secondary schools, Mums persuaded Dad that, that, that that moment and exam result did not define him or his capabilities and was no predictor of his future, that he was destined to do well. She was right. This was a lesson using the power of her experience and reasoning, but some of the lessons Grant taught Dad came with the persuasive power of the end of a strap. You did without the compassion she showed to her patients. Dad hated the nightly baths in the ice cold water in St. George. He would often go into the shower, stand far from the water, let it run, and then come back up. One night, Dad was in the bathroom after his usual tricks, went to his shop. Gran made a dramatic entrance and put some lashes in it. She let him know that she was outside listening and could not be fooled by him. And it was clear to her that the water was hitting the hard tiles of the shower floor and not his sweaty body that was in need of a wash. I can assure you that from that night onward, my dad learned to love shower tanning, preferring the cold water to his mother's warm heated legs. It was also from months that my dad learned some of his political strategy. I told you her story was in many aspects the story of Barbados. Like many others, my grand had been a lifelong dead until Pierre Motley led the Barbados Civil Party in 2018. My grandmother was firmly of the view that if a political candidate or party wanted her vote, they had to earn it. Dad would probably have given his clients the same advice over the years. Having advised and guided through elections, some 27 Caribbean prime ministers and their political parties, earning him the reputation of the region's premier political strategist. Grants was the most difficult vote to secure in Christchurch to the central. Maurice King, Duncan Carter, Ronald Jones, and Ryan Strong were all subjected to our crash programs on the art of effective representation and the price that would be paid for failing to deliver. Ryan Strong's first canvas of her program South in 2018 lasted three hours, of which two hours and 15 minutes were spent at my grandmother's house, where he was required to make the case for her vote. Grand then sent candidate Ryan, as he then was, away without a good word, but later confided to that, that she had been impressed with Ryan's seriousness, demeanor, and answers to her questions, and for the first time in her life, she would vote for the BLP. Mums later became one of his canvassers, and died as one of Minister Strong's biggest defenders in the constituency of Christchurch East Centre. But I am an ambassador. I know nothing about the electors of one over or how elections are lost for one. That is the role of H. Henry Sr. My uncle Tyson was born in 1988, long after his oldest siblings, and was very much the baby of the family. He benefited from older siblings who could care for and guide him. At the time of her passing, Uncle Tyson was living with her at her building. Sea baths were a part of her daily therapy but she could no longer go to the beach. So her baby son brought the beach to her. Early every morning, in an effort to avoid sargasm CP, he journeyed long distances, sometimes as far away as Martin's Bay, in order to fill 12 six-gallon containers of seawater and take them home, to then fill an inflatable pool for her daily sea baths, which she greatly enjoyed. A couple of days ago, Tyson told me, he would do it again if he could. Everyone, everyone remarked on Mums' cooking. Tyson particularly loved her signature dishes, me as well, such as plain fish and sweet potato pie, for which many requested the recipes. Mums was a social services agency all by herself, insisting that a single parent in the neighborhood take the gift of a bed, giving money to those in need, preparing meals for workmen and others who needed them, including giving meaningful work, meals, and money to someone in the neighborhood who was mentally challenged. In Mums' charitable endeavors, 
Kaisa would often be pressed into service as delivery man and messenger. Although she was not a drinker, every Christmas, Dad's fame stock became my grandmother's source of free liquor for her service providers, such as the postman and the sanitation workers, for whom she cooked Christmas lunch. It was after such, it was after one such raid of his on his supply that Dad discovered Mums had taken a bottle of rare high-end liquor. Hoping that he had moved soon enough to secure its return, Dad inquired of its whereabouts only to be told by Mums that the postman had loved the gift of that particular drink, that the bottle was so unusual and striking that he would get some decorative or other use for it after the contents, after the contents of the bottle had been fully consumed. Uncle Tyson, who is, I would say unfortunately, part of the up and on posse, earned a first degree and a master's and followed that into journalism and public relations. Days before she passed, Mums heard a rumor that Uncle Tyson is tipped to become the Chief Information Officer of Government Information Service. On hearing this, my grandmother said that she could go in peace, knowing her children were past the worst, qualified, successful, able to hold their own, and that no one could unfair them. As we say, she realized they were set. To the end, the well-being of her children was paramount. COVID-19 and her illness stopped her church attendance. But grandmother was a baptized member of the People's Cathedral. Her faith sustained her throughout the passing of her daughter and later through her own diagnosis. She never asked, why me? Never complained of pain never expressed anger about her condition, never a trace of bitterness. Mums faced her illness with quiet acceptance of and faith in the will of God. Rather than shrinking, her faith grew stronger and she drew closer to God. She spent the minutes before her passing in prayer. Right until the end, my grandmother rose, exhibited what the Bible describes as the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so today, in bidding a farewell to a woman who is truly the personification of her name, Rose, I end as I began, echo the words of our Savior from St. Matthew. Well done, sister. Well done, Mommy. Well done, Grandma. Well done, dear friend and confidant. Well done, Nurse Henry. Well done. We love you always. Rest now. Rest in peace eternally. Love you. Please remain seated as we sing verses 1 and 2 of To God Be the Glory. Oh, 
for effect. Oh, perfect redemption. The vilest offender. I now speak to you in the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We thank Almighty God for the life of Rosemary Ursula, her work, her witness, and contribution to her family and country. We have known the Henry family from our earliest years, and had a close relationship with them. As we heard in the eulogy, Rosemary loved her family, gave her children the very best she could, lived a quiet and peaceful life, and acknowledged the Lord of all the earth. May she rest in peace. The privilege is ours to address you this morning in this home going service for Rosemary Ursula Henry. And we are doing so using the theme Dominus Vobiscum. Dominus Vobiscum. And in this regard, I want you to turn to the person to your right and to your left and salute them with this theme, Dominus Vobiscum. Next slide. Next, I want the family to remain seated and I want the congregation to stand, all of us beside the family, please stand. And I want you to repeat loudly to this family, Dominus Vorbiscum. You may have your seat. I know many of you are wondering what is Dominus Vorbiscum. It is a familiar salutation. Our grandparents say it or said it to us, our parents say it to us, our priests and pastors say it to us, as well as our fellow worshipers. And in simple English, it means the Lord be with you. So now that you understand better what is Dominus Vobiscum, Turn to the person to your right and to your left and say to them, the Lord be with you. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The origin of the salutation the Lord be with you, is found in the book of Ruth, the second chapter, as Boaz addressed his employees. And Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, read as follows. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, 
the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears from after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. The statements, The Lord be with you, and the Lord bless thee, represent the exchange of salutations or greetings between an employer, Boaz, and his employee, the reapers of barley. Today we wish to borrow the salutation of Boaz. The Lord be with you to encourage and provide comfort to all family and relatives and friends of Rosemary Ursula Henry, especially her sons, Harlan Tyson, her siblings, Verna, Reverend Beryl, Helen, Mellis, and Joan, her grands and great grands, nephew, nieces, cousins, and friends. The Lord be with you, as I prefer Dominus Vobis come. Quickly, I'm going to address you on just four brief points. The Lord be with you in his person. The Lord be with you in his presence. The Lord be with you in his protection. And the Lord be with you in his power. I'm sure I won't get through all of it, but we'll make the best that we know how. The Lord be with you during this time of grief and sorrow and in his person. There are many names for the Lord, but the one I want to share with you who are grieving today is the Lord in his person, the omniscient one. The omniscient one. And the one who knows the end from the beginning. And so even before the death of your loved one, God had it in control. And God will sustain you through this. Isaiah the prophet writes in Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God. There is none else. I am God and there is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. And that is an encouragement to all of us. I prefer to put my faith in the person who knows my end from my beginning. And that person is Almighty God. And to him today, we ascribe all the honor and all the glory. Family and friends who are suffering, this God who knows everything, he knows how you feel today. He knows your pain. He knows your sorrow. And he feels and knows your loss. The psalmist describes God's knowledge like this in Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my dung sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my 
town. But lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Then he ends like this. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. This is the omniscient God. And I want to comfort you, to strengthen you, to let you know that this God is able to sustain you through this time of love. Church, if you believe that this is true, somebody say amen. amen. Before I move on to the Lord be with you in his presence, I want to digress just for a minute or so to say some words of encouragement and counsel to our Prime Minister, the Honorable Mayor Amor Motley. I just wish to digress for a little bit this morning. Some may not agree with what I'm going to say next, but I know I have the mind of God. And every now and then, I think politicians need to be encouraged. Need to be encouraged. Prime Minister, you are doing a great work in the management and leadership on this small but beautiful nation. We are conscious that Prime Minister, the Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, is present with us and has done a great job for his country, leading it through many a difficult situation. But we are sure he will agree and understand if we focus on Barbados for a little bit this moment. My respect and admiration for you, Prime Minister, is such that if the situation arose where our casting vote was required for a leader of the entire world, we would rise to our feet and say, Mr. or Madam Speaker, as a loyal son of the fields and hills of the most easterly Caribbean islands, it gives me the greatest of pleasures, not regrettably, to cast my vote for the Honorable Mayor Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, a strict guardian of our heritage and a firm craftswoman of our faith. <laughs> Prime Minister, these are not just words to make you feel good. We say them with total sincerity, not meaning that you're God or infallible. Like all of us, you have and will continue to make mistakes, but your heart is in the right place. And it's clearly for this country, this region, and the marginalized and disadvantaged peoples on the earth. Just by the way, I see the Honorable Ryan Strong with us and other ministers. We fully support the decision to enter a new agreement with the International Monetary Fund and say to you and your government that the decision to introduce the debt for financial swap is absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. Now, now please note, everybody, that we bear no relation to Beresford Leon Padmore. And Hardy will immediately recognize that phrase. Nor are we expecting anything from the Prime Minister as we are doing for the family of the late Rosemary Ursula, we are simply taking the opportunity to encourage our Prime Minister to continue in her fight 
to bring this nation to prosperity again. But, but, we also speak to you, Prime Minister, as one of the servants of the living God who wants the best for you. As Jethro counsel Moses, so we counsel you today. From our vantage point, and not knowing what being Prime Minister entails, you appear to be doing too much. Slow down. Delegate more of the responsibilities to your colleagues. At your last press conference, when we heard you outline the number of meetings you had to attend in different parts of the world, our spirit was moved to address you on the matter. You know what to do, how to get things done, but Prime Minister, please, pause. Slow down. That's my counsel to you. Secondly, as the Apostle John wished for the beloved guests, we wish above all things that you be in health. Even as your leadership prospers, we believe you are taking care of your health, but we encourage you to do so with even more determination. And lastly, as admonished by the voices of all men, King Solomon, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. This is my counsel to you on this 20th day of September 20. 22. Now back to my address. Not only is the Lord with you in his person, but he is also with you in his presence. After one of Moses' lowest moments in the leadership on the children of Israel, when they made and worshipped the golden calf, he prayed to God as follows. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And God said to him, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. And he said unto God, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not hence, because he understood the presence of the Lord and what it meant to him. The psalmist writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The presence of God. And Jesus himself towards the end of his life assured his disciples, and lo, I am with you always, always, even in life and in death. Hartley and Angela and Tyson and all of you know that God is constantly with you and by yourself as you go through this phase of your life. We say to the family today, be comforted, be strengthened as God's presence was with Moses and David and the disciples of Jesus his presence is also with you. Yes, we have two prime ministers, a deputy prime minister, ministers of government, ministers of religion, business leaders, workers' representatives, civil society leaders, friends, well-wishers. We are all here together with you at this service. But 
of utmost importance is the fact that the greatest of all persons, the Lord himself, your creator and sustainer and master is with you. Therefore, make sure you acknowledge him and give him the glory that is due unto his name. Let the church say amen. amen. Quickly, not only his person and his presence, but the Lord is with you in his protection over you and for over all of us. And I thank God that he is a great protector. And the psalmist explains this beautifully in Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Somebody help me say it. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Family, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. Ah, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth. And somebody said, even forevermore. Not only is the Lord with you in his person, in his presence, and in his protection, but finally, the Lord is with you in his power. And I, I, I am one who believes in Almighty God. We may find other names to call him, but whatever we call him, he is still the preeminent one. He is still the supreme one. And to think that this God is with me, that encourages my heart. Despite whatever I am going through, despite whoever is against me, I know that the Lord himself is for me. And I say to you, if God is for you, then no man can be against you. He is with you in his power, and he has power over the sea. He has power over the land. He has power over the sky, over sickness, over life, over death, over the grave, over evil, and over the devil. God has the power. Power to heal. Power to deliver. Power to save. Power to set free. And Jesus caps it all by sin. In Matthew 28, verse 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in the earth. Therefore, because the Lord is with you in his person, with you in his presence, with you in his protection, and with you in his power, Therefore, be comforted today that amidst the pain, sorrow, and loss caused by the death and separation of your loved one, Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord is with you. The Lord, the master of all, the Lord, the omniscient one, the Lord, the omnipresent one, and the Lord, the omnipotent one. Domus come, vobis come. The Lord is with you. And in return, it behoves you to respond to him in such a manner to make sure that you give him control over your life. You give him control over your life. And you will be surprised what the Lord will do for you. What the Lord will do 
for you. He will do great things for you. And he will sustain you through all of this. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we all say, and we all say, come on, if you believe God is a good God, put your hands together and give him all the praise. Let's all stand. We thank you for being here to support this family and the passing of Rosemary Ursula Henry. We thank you for all your words of condolences, all your words of greetings. And she is now resting in the hand of God. And may she continue to rest in peace and rise in glory. We shall now have the closing prayer and benediction by the Reverend John Edwards. God bless you. Good morning. I can easily do a closing prayer, but first I want to say on behalf of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Huntersville, North Carolina, our church family send our condolences to you, the Henry family. My wife and I, we continue to hold you in prayer. I'm not going to do another sermon, but I think it's important that there's some coincidence. And I normally don't say they are coincidence. They're just greatnesses of God. Yesterday, many of us were tuned to our television to watch the homegoing service of the Queen. And if you remember, the lesson that was chosen for the Queen was John's Gospel 14, 1 to 6. And then the cousin of the family came here and he said, last night just one verse kept picking at him. And then his brother told him, and then he got this morning and said, John 14, 1 to 6. And then our Prime Minister, Dominica, read it so well, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. Rosemary prepared a place for you. And when I say her in the name of the queen, we always know the queen and they spoke about her in the form of serve. She served. And if you look at the front of our program, we see a nurse. And what do nurses do? They serve. I remember I said to Harley, I'm coming. What do you want me to wear? He says, I would like you to wear something purple. That gospel, 14, 1 to 6, is Jesus at the closing of his ministry where he was giving instructions to his disciples how to live. Purple is normally the color we wear through Lent. And it's a time we mourn, but we know in those 40 days and 40 nights what comes after Easter. And we know there is a celebration that will come. So I say to you, darkness may endure for a night, but joy and love comes in the morning. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let us pray for the Henry family and their friends, that they may know the sustaining power of God's love and the prayerful fellowship of God's people. Merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, Deal graciously with Rosemary family in their grief. Surround them with their love that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss. But have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come through Jesus Christ, O Lord, Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of those who depart hence in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful after they have delivered from their burdens of flesh are in joy and felicity. We give thee hearty thanks for the good examples of all those servants who have finished their course in faith, do not rest from their labors. And we beseech thee with all who have departed in true faith of thy holy name, may have your perfect consummation and bliss. 
both in body and soul, in the internal, everlasting, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, O Christian soul, depart from this world, from the God who created you, his son Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you, and the Holy Spirit who sustain you. Almighty God and Father of all mercies and giver of comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with all who born, that casting their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, rest eternal grant to her, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine on her. May her soul and the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. May the God of peace, who have brought again the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of sheep, through the blood and everlasting covenant, make you perfect in the good work to do his will, working in you which all well and pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And may the peace of God which passeth all understanding keep in your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of our Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you care for and pray for this day and forevermore. Amen. Our recessional verse, verse 3 of great things of to God be the glory. Great things he has taught us. Great things
Yes, sir. Can you give us an applause? And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of this tree were for the healing of the nation. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, 
neither light on the sun. For the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raised, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of course is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. Reverend Evers will now come and do the prayer after which we shall have a committal. O Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, we pray to thee thy passion, cross, and death. Between thy judgment and our souls now and in the hour of our death, give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to the Holy Church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory, who with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit livest and reignest one God now and forever. Father of all, we pray to you for those we love but see no longer. Grant them your peace, let light perpetual shine upon them, and in your loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of your perfect will, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of comfort, you graciously we pray for who more, and cast in all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God in His wise providence to take out of this world our dear beloved, we commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, looking for the resurrection of the last day and the life of the world to come through our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose coming to judge the world, the earth and the sea shall give up their death. The bodies of those who sleep in him shall be changed and be made like unto his glory, according to that power by which he is able to subdue all things. Yeah. 
place so bright and
in mercy he will not always chide neither will he keep his anger forever he have not dealt with us after our sin and nor rewarded us according to our iniquities for as the heaven is high above the earth so great is his mercy toward them that fear him as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass. As the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. For him, then our, the Lord's prayer, and then we shall pronounce the benediction. After that, the final hymn.
to stand together and repeat the prayer as Jesus taught us. Together, our Father, Again, we say to the family, the Lord be with you. We thank all of you again on their behalf for coming, staying, and supporting them during this time. And let us continue to keep them in our prayer. I shall not pronounce the benediction. I want you to turn someone close to you and repeat to them after me. The Lord bless you. And the Lord keep you. The Lord make this face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his fountain unto you and give you peace both now forevermore and we all say yes. finally him Very good afternoon to one and all. Um, just when you thought you would have completed this exercise without hearing my voice, um, <laughs> but I couldn't allow us to leave this evening without expressing uh, Tyson and myself our very heartfelt thanks and appreciation to all of you who would have uh, contributed not only in terms of your attendance today, but from the commencement of this journey uh, just over a year ago, um, many of you have re reported for duty 
and you said up front, we are with you, we are going to work with you. It has been a long struggle, it has been a hard task, but in the end, um, the will of God has been made known, and we are truly grateful that you have stood the course with us. Today in particular, I wish to thank first the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados, who uh, broke off a very hectic and um, necessary international itinerary to fly home in the late hours of last night to attend to this funeral, and who will also be departing immediately after to return to New York in the hope of representing Barbados at the highest of high levels, the United Nations General Assembly. He sincerely, on behalf of my family, thank you, Prime Minister Motley, for making that ultimate sacrifice to be here next to, uh, to be a part of this event today. It means the, the world to Tyson, myself, and the entire Henry family, and all the well-wishers. I would also like to thank Prime Minister, my personal friend, uh, Skerritt of Dominica, who also, on hearing of the passing of my mom, made major changes to his own travel itinerary, and uh, who should have traveled to uh, yesterday, I think, uh, to reschedule his departure, to also to accommodate this funeral today, and who also will be departing Barbados uh, very soon, immediately after, to head to the airport to fly out as well. This is the ultimate um, manifestation of true friendship and support, and it also speaks to the impact that my money would have made on, the, on the, the, both Prime Minister Motley and Prime Minister Skerritt over the years. I also wish to thank all of you, I, I, and, and I, I don't wish to begin to um, identify names, but certainly I couldn't uh, not mention um, Dr. Capian Cave Henry, who also was with this journey with us from the very go, get go. Uh, we, we, it, it involved not only here in Barbados, but in the United States, elsewhere and back here, and what have you. And she never, she was unflinching. Uh, she always um, saw, you know, uh, give it her best. Sometimes 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, she's on her way home and she says, well, I'm going to come across my auntie Rose and see what's happening. Kathy, we sincerely appreciate all that you did and what have you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the chairman, executive chairman of the... Um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, this is Juliet uh, Bino Sutherland, who really went over and beyond the call of duty to assist my mummy in her last few days when she was also at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And the two of them, I think, struck up and built a very good friendship. And, um, and that really was uh, very touching for us. And I really wish to thank uh, uh, this is a Sutherland for that very good gesture. Also, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Santia Bradshaw, who also served as a kind of joint chairperson of these proceedings with my cousin, uh, Kerwin, the two of them, all that you see here today, all of the preparations, when Tyson and myself were emotionally high and low, they kept very, very strong, they kept very focused, and they have brought about the type of dignified exit that I think my mom would have appreciated. And if any of you who knew her know that she's watching because she's a funeral person and she would have been marking very high and very hard and I'm sure that she would have given us a passing grade and for that I am indebted to Santia and to Kerwin and others. I also wish to thank Sor and her dear daughter from Ecuador who came in, who tried the best when Western medicine uh, was not enough and Western medicine indicated to us one thing, they came up and they stepped in in the last two weeks of her life there were the caregivers who really, in my opinion, also get, uh, assisted and given her a very dignified exit. I'm happy to, and pleased to tell you there was very little pain, there was very little discomfort. She died very peacefully, and that is one of the things that we, that we went to. And if um, without, um, not last, and we certainly would like to thank Reverend Brathwick and Reverend Ed, uh, Pastor Father Edwards for their tremendous work. Um, you know, at very short notice, uh, this was a very well-organized, well-executed uh, ceremony, and I think again, it's the type of exit that we would have wished for my dear mother. Last but certainly not least, I wish to thank um, Mr. James Wilson and the staff of Downs and Wilson Funeral Home, and I and I say that without unhesitatingly, because up to yesterday, when my family and I and I've been very, very I'm very protective of my four aunts. And um, the toughest day in this was yesterday when in the lead up to um, our having to go 
to um, the Eagle Hall to, for the viewing, I took it my, on myself to go first. And I said, okay, let me see, let me have a, 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 a peep, as it were, and see exactly what I've been done. And Mr. Wilson, I must say to you, better could not have been, could have been achieved. You were brilliant. We are very happy with the work today, not only in terms, as we would say, the turnout, not only in terms of your professional artistry in terms of the preparation of my mom, but from day one, uh, we called Mr. Wilson and Sean Sunday. I spoke to him about 20 times, and I thought that was a record until uh, Kerwin and uh, Tyson and all others told me they spoke to him about 25. So I don't know what time he had for himself. But certainly, when it comes to service, and I'm not doing an ad for Downs and Wilson, but I tell you now, um, you are my funeral director. It's the service of choice. And I'm telling this to my family. Uh, take me nowhere else but Downs and Wilson. So, so certainly, I wish to thank all of you here who have come and who are part of this process. And I really wish you a very lovely afternoon. Certainly, my friend Mark Maloney, sorry, Mark, who again was with us from the very day, Banner, and my very good buddies, Dennis Cadogan, and I know Mike Ford is, is, is listening and following somewhere, because Mike Ford, I, I recall, if I give you a quick joke, when my when my mum was at the QEH, and you know she wasn't doing the best, and everyone was given 15, 20 minutes to go and be with her and the council and everything. Uh, Mike called me one day and he told me, I, I look for mums. So I, I, I messaged her, I call her, and I tell her, well, Mike is coming. I, I, you know, so I tell her, well, you know, give him 10, 15 minutes, and then he'll be all right. So Mike got me about 10 past four, and he told me, I'm here, I'm here. I said, okay. So I said, okay, well, I'll give, give them a couple minutes. So about um, 6.30, quarter to seven, I messaged Mike, and I asked him, well, how did it go? What do, what do you thought? Mike said, man, leave me alone. We're here talking politics, man. Leave me alone, man. <laughs> At all quarter to seven, <laughs> Mike and my mom still there talking politics about all sorts of things. Right? He said, we talking politics. I don't think Mike left me until nearly eight o'clock that night. <laughs> you know, so that was it, because he was able to touch that that nerve in my mommy. And I, but the next morning I went there, she was as energized as anything because she had three hours of politics talking. Yeah. Like so I really wish to thank my friends and, and, and all of those who have been there with us and to again wish you all a very lovely evening. Thank Mr. Zang, my very good friend, and uh, Jack and Tracy who have also been part of this journey as well in terms of making sure that we really uh, were able to, to, to manage this process over the last few months. Thanks again on behalf of Tyson and I wish you all a very pleasant evening and thanks again for making this the dignified exit that we wanted. Thank you. Thank you.